Good morning. So good to see you guys. So we had an opportunity to gather with our family last week to celebrate our 50th wedding anniversary. Yeah, which actually is next Saturday. But some of our grandchildren had to return to school in North Carolina. They start early. So we, uh, we decided to go early, but wanted to show you a couple of pictures from the cruise. So this is my husband telling all of our grandchildren about how we met. So you see our original wedding picture on the table, and our oldest daughter decided to get me a veil, which was weird. But, but they were all listening to their papa, you know, talk about how we met. And we, I was 15, he was 17. And so he, he told the story, which was kind of fun because it's a legacy, you know. So the next picture, this is the family gathered with the exception of a couple. There was 23 of us that went together on this cruise. And what I want to mention to you as you're looking at this picture is the world might say, this is a family that has experienced trauma, tragedy, health challenges, brokenness, grief, addiction, abuse, and relational breakdown. And this has all happened over the last few years. But God's word says that he is this family's healer and redeemer. And so you can't see him, but behind Randy's head is our son-in-law who was separated from our family for five and a half years. He went on this trip with us. And so that was restoration. Um, Rochelle Lawyer is actually not pictured in this, and she went on the trip with us because my children and grandchildren all know her as Aunt Ro. And so there was just a lot of healing that took place. And I think sometimes we look at outward appearances and we go, oh, well, they just have it all together, you know? But the fact of the matter is, is that every family unit experiences things in their, in their time together. But we need to revere what God is doing in the midst rather than what the enemy has done. Amen? And then the last picture is our golden anniversary sunset from the deck of the cruise ship. So, but yeah, I, it was a wonderful time. It was a wonderful relational time. Um, I had all of my grandchildren together for the first time since in three years, and they couldn't get off the boat. So they had to spend time with us, and, you know, it was just a great way of capturing their attention. I think we probably broke carnival. Our one grandson was eating 10 ice cream cones a day, and they have pizza until 2 a.m. in the morning, and so I think they ate more than... He texted me this morning. He said, hey, Nana, I only gained one pound. I said, dude, I want your metabolism. <laughs> but I want to um, also just talk about during this last week, we had some new things happen in our midst. We have a new member of the Horner family. Israel Joseph, I'm sorry, Israel James Horner was born to Eric and Leanna this past week, yeah. Robert Austin, who does security and is Rochelle Sherman's son, got married yesterday. Woohoo! And I think there might be something else that maybe somebody wants to share. Maybe? Don't leave me hanging up here. <laughs> We're going to have another baby. <laughs> Hello, thank We are exponentially growing our children's department. We need more help. We are so excited for you guys. And uh, you are such beautiful parents, and we see that in the way that you care for Elizabeth, and we're so excited for you. So God bless you guys. 
I'm sorry. When are they due? Beginning of February. All right. So that's all the announcements. I guess I'm done. All right. Well, we are going to go over the cost of sacrifice today, true sacrifice, living a life fully surrendered to Christ. We just finished the series, Suit Up, informing us how to apply the armor of God in our lives and to ward off the attacks of our enemy. Thank you, Rob Card, for finishing up the uh, series with the final message as we were gone. What incredible timing for us to be able to receive this critical information during this season in our lives. As I was contemplating all the things that have been shared about the armor of God and how to stand, we are called to maintain the spiritual ground that we have taken, but we are also called to advance forward. That is the purpose of an army. You maintain what you've taken, but you also advance forward. So I thought about the perspective of sacrifice. You know, we often think of sacrifice being that of what Jesus did for us. He became the ultimate sacrifice that reconciled us back to the Father. And so now we are seen through the sacrifice in the blood of Christ, not through our own attempts and deeds, which always fall miserably short. So when you're being viewed, you're being viewed through the sacrifice and the blood of Jesus. You're not being viewed by what you can do right. What you can do right is a spirit of religion. See, righteousness comes from God. It is promoted from a heart that wants to be close and connected to God. So we choose to not do the things that we're tempted with because we want to be in close proximity. Religion says, I'll just do it right. I'll just make it look right. And that is a spirit of performance, and that will never draw you closer to the Father. We see many references in the Old Testament, and the Apostle Paul also addressed sacrifice in the New Testament. But we were, we're going to take a brief look at a couple of them from the Old Testament. But what I want you to look at today is your sacrifice unto the Lord. We live in a culture that speaks highly of sacrifice. Military, law enforcement, parenthood, to name a few. Yet our actions seem to be sacrificial in nature. Or are they self-serving? Let's take a look at some of these passages together and consider sacrifice from a biblical perspective. So let me open with this, the picture of sacrifice. Imagine a painter standing before a blank canvas. With each stroke, they are pouring their heart and soul into this work. The beauty of the painting lies not just in the colors or the skill, but in the sacrifice of time, energy, and emotion that the artist invests. Similarly, our lives as Christians are meant to be a masterpiece of sacrifice, painted with the strokes of devotion and surrender to God. We're going to take a look at Genesis 22 and 2 Samuel 24. Today, we're going to explore the theme of sacrifice through these two profound biblical narratives, the story of Abraham and Isaac in Genesis 22 and King David's sacrifice on the threshing floor in 2 Samuel 24. These stories illustrate what true sacrifice looks like and how it calls us to live a life fully surrendered to God. Let's look at the story of Abraham and Isaac in Genesis 22. We find the heart-wrenching account of Abraham 
being asked to sacrifice his beloved son, Isaac. Not anyone asked to sacrifice a child would be over the top disturbed. But asking a man who waited until he was 100 years old and his wife was 90 to have, and they had this child and then to sacrifice this child, now that's really hard. Abraham's willingness to obey God's command, even when it meant giving up his most treasured possession, is a powerful testament to the depth of his faith and his surrender. The moment that Abraham raised the knife, an angel of the Lord intervenes, providing a ram as a substitute. This story reveals that true sacrifice is not about the loss, but it's about the heart of obedience and trust in God's provision. And I want you to really hear that because a lot of times we're so focused on what we believe that we're going to lose or what God is taking away. We're not focused on the fact that we have to have a heart of obedience and we have to trust in God's provision. I'm going to read out of the passage in Genesis 22. Sometime later, God tested Abraham, and he said, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering. On a mountain, I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Three days, people. He's traveling three days thinking about this. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, then we will come back to you. You hear that? We will worship, and we will come back to you. Did God tell him that Isaac was going to come back? Abraham trusted the Lord. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there, arranged the wood on it. He bound his son, Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket was a, he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over, he took the ram and he sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide on the mountain of the Lord. It will be provided. What an incredible story of obedience. Could it be that when the Lord is asking for a sacrifice of our time, our resources, that perhaps he is reviewing our response of obedience rather than our lack of response? We used to share this phrase with our our children when they were growing up and were asked to do something. Your delayed obedience is disobedience. 
Let me say that again before one of you might say, well, I'm just a procrastinator by nature. No, your delayed obedience is disobedience. What is a burnt offering? In the Hebrew, a burnt offering meant for something to ascend or go up in smoke. The offering was completely destroyed, and the symbolism of the complete destruction was in an effort to renew the relationship between a holy God and a sinful man. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was the fulfillment of the burnt offering. His physical life was completely consumed. He then ascended to the Father, and his sacrifice became the atonement of our sins, restoring for all of those who believe a right relationship with the Father. So our sacrifice is to be these things, wholehearted. Do we have those we can put up? No? There we are. Wholehearted. A recognition that without his sacrifice, that we have no recourse, no hope. In accepting his sacrifice, our sacrifice likewise will have a cost. If you need to, either write them down, Take a picture with your phone. These are good to remember. So what are those costs? No longer living a life separately, but allowing him to live through us. Our selfish desires no longer rule, but is submitted to his lordship. It's done out of obedience, by love, and not in our convenience. There is a consecration that is expected on our parts in our lives. How do we view things? How do we act? How do we speak? How do we treat others? And it is and should be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Let's go to the second passage in 2 Samuel 24. This is King David's threshing floor. So we're going to fast forward to that. You can also find it in 1 Chronicles 21, 18 through 24. After sinning against God by taking a census, so a census is the counting of people and their resources in a geographical area, David did this in Israel. David is instructed by the prophet Gad to appease the Lord, that he needed to be obedient to build an altar on the threshing floor of Ara. Hard word, right, Bill? Arana. Arana, the Jebusite. Arana offers a space in the materials for free. But David refuses because he said, I will not sacrifice to the Lord my burnt offerings that cost me nothing. David's determination to offer something of value underscores that true sacrifice involves personal cost and genuine commitment. Let me read from this passage in 2 Samuel. On that day, Gad went to David and said to him, go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aranach the Jebusite. So David went up as the Lord had commanded through Gad. When Aranach looked and saw the king and his officials coming towards him, he went out and bowed down before the king with his face to the ground. Arana said, why has the Lord, the king, come to his servant to buy your threshing floor, David answered, so I can build an altar to the Lord that the plague on the people may be stopped. Arana said to David, let my lord, the king, take whatever he wishes and offer it up. Here are oxen for the burnt offering. Here are the threshing sledges and the ox yokes for the wood. Your majesty, Arana gives all this to the king. 
Arana also said to him, may the Lord your God accept you. But the king replied to Arana, no, I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So who is Gad in verse 18? He was a prophet. He was a son of Jacob. So the prophet of the Lord was ordered by the angel of the Lord to go tell David to build an altar. Now this property happened to belong to a man, Arana, or his name was also Ornan, and that means strong in Hebrew. But he also happened to be a Jebusite, and Jebusites were not part of the tribes of Israel. They were considered to be heathen, and his, that means trodden, downtrodden in Hebrew. So it would have made sense for King David to receive this gift of the, of the of the Lord and of the threshing floor from the Jebusite, but David understood that there needed to be a cost on his part. The threshing floor was an interesting place to build an altar. It was a place that the harvest was brought into from the field, and it was a place where the separation of the chaff or husk from the wheat took place. So the chaff could represent that which is in our lives, which holds us back from experiencing greater intimacy with the Lord because of our self-focus. That separation produces fruitfulness in our lives, greater production and revelation of the Lord and his ways. So sacrifice involves our loss of always thinking of ourselves first, loss, who's singing? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so loss of always thinking of ourselves first loss of our excuses why we won't obey, honoring him first in all we do and not ourselves. The cost of true sacrifice is this, living a life that is fully surrendered to Christ, weaving the stories together. These two stories, Genesis 22 and 2 Samuel 24, the heart of sacrifice, so both of these stories highlight crucial aspects of our sacrificial life, obedience and trust. Abraham's willingness to sacrifice Isaac demonstrated his unwavering trust in God. True sacrifice involves stepping out in faith, trusting that the God's plans are higher than our own. There was a personal cost to David. David's refusal to offer a sacrifice that cost him nothing teaches us that real sacrifice involves giving up something valuable. It's not about the convenience, but it's about a heartfelt offering that reflects our love and our devotion to God. You know, I thought about this as I was reading these passages, just about the fact that what was so wrong with taking that what the Jebusite was offering? I mean, he as the king could have been able to use that in the way that was offered, but David's heart was that he wanted to be so connected to God that he saw his sacrifice as being part of that connection. I think in the Western church, we've lost the ability to understand that. We think that as long as we show up on a Sunday morning, as long as we you know, live a, a pretty good life and we're pretty good to people, that, that, you know, that should demonstrate that we're a godly people. But I really believe we're stepping into an hour and into a time where sacrificial living is going to be 
really demanded of the body of Christ. You know, I thought about in World War II when there were people that took Jews into their home and transported them at their own personal cost because of the fact that they believed that humanity had a value. There are things that I believe are coming on the earth that are going to demand sacrificial living of the body of Christ. That's not to scare you. That's not to put fear into you. That's to prepare you. And I think that if we recognize that God's provision is abundantly profound and present, if our trust is in him, if our faith is unwavering, if our obedience is immediate, that's why our yes is so important in this hour. And so we really need to understand that God is preparing us. He's, he's not leaving you like an orphan to say, well, hope it all goes well. You know, when stuff starts unraveling, I hope you'll be okay. No, he's preparing you in this hour. He's giving you the tools that you need in order to live a life that is abundant and, and is, is over the top an overcomer. I see so many people that are so overwhelmed by their circumstances in their life. And I get it. I mean, we've lived through some really pretty tumultuous times in our family's life. But you're going to have to make a choice. You're going to have to make a choice if you're going to serve God. If you're going to believe that he is the God in the scripture that we read about, and he will do what he says he will do. And it's not about just playing games. I don't know about you. I don't got time to play games. I don't want to play games. You know, when God woke me up in the recovery room where I almost died in the hospital and spoke to me and said, I choose life and death, and for you this day, I choose life. The trajectory of my life changed at that point. I no longer was a church attender. I was part of the kingdom of God, and I was a daughter of the Most High. And I have not gone back to living differently from that point. If you haven't had a Damascus Road experience, if you haven't had your life turned upside down and, and changed, then I really encourage you to connect with God and ask him to do a complete transformation in your life. Because I care about you, and I care about what God is doing in you and through you, and I see you as powerful people, not people who are just sitting back waiting for the rapture to come which I might have to tell you, it might not happen. And so what will you do if it doesn't? Will you be overcomers? Will you be warriors? Will you occupy? Will you continue to share the word of God? Will you be obedient? Will you trust? And I know I'm totally going off script here, but oh well. This is because of the fact that God has this in his heart for you. Some of you have lived a life that has been horrendous. Some of you have experienced things that I never have. But the fact of the matter is that God is still God. He's still God, and he's still at work to will and to do his good pleasure in your life. And he takes all things and makes them good but it's how you're going to see it. It's how you are willing to change with that rather than feeling like, oh, well, I'm just an Eeyore. No, you're not. You're a daughter or a son of the Most High God. So we are called to live a life of sacrifice in Christ. In Romans 12:1, Paul urges us to present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. I figured out what sacrifice was this past week when 
our cabin on the cruise ship was at the front of the ship and all the food was at the back of the ship. And we were walking between eight and 10,000 steps a day just to go feed our face. The sacrifice. But honestly, he's looking for a people that want to connect with him. See, what COVID did to us is it caused us to disconnect. It caused us to become fearful. It caused us to be self-absorbed. It caused us to be in a place where it's like yesterday. I came home and I had a little bit of a, I don't know. I don't know what it was. I was in 90 plus degree weather and going into air conditioning and I coughed a couple of times and people looked at me like I had the bubonic plague. It's fear. It's fear that the culture is living in. God's people need to live differently. We need to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. We need to be holy and pleasing to God. This is our true and our proper worship to him. Our sacrifice today may not involve altars and burnt offerings, but they do involve surrendering your time, your talents, your worship, your treasures for God's purposes. What is our time? It's prioritizing time with God in prayer and scripture and really for God's people. I mean, we've gotten to the point where it's like if we have to go visit somebody in the hospital, it's like, oh, how am I going to fit this into my schedule? Come on, people. Let's love one another better. Let's do this better. Life is busy. I get it. But the bottom line is, is that that sacrifice will have an eternal weight of glory. Our talents, using our God-given gifts to serve others and advance his kingdom. Our treasures, generously giving of our resource to support God's work, even when it stretches our faith. When you tithe, you're not tithing to this church, you're tithing to God's kingdom. We support missionaries all over the world. We're not just here to, you know, get your money and then say goodbye. We're here to advance the kingdom of God wherever God is at work. We have missionaries in Mexico. We have missionaries in Brazil. I'm sorry, Argentina. We have missionaries in the United States that are doing work. So we need to recognize that when we give of our resource, it goes beyond what we can see. Practical application for today. Steps towards a sacrificial life. First of all, examine your heart. Reflect on the areas where God might be calling you to a deeper surrender. You know, I had opportunity to talk with somebody this past week, our daughter-in-law who lost her husband, our son, three years ago, brought her new boyfriend on a cruise. Talk about embracing relational. You know, I mean, all of us were still like, okay, we got to do this. You know, we got we to gotta recognize life goes on. But I was talking with him and I said, you know, if you are looking to get involved in a deeper relationship with our daughter-in-law, the best gift that you can give her is inner healing and deliverance in your life. All you are super quiet. The best gift that we can give someone else when we are to be intimately connected to them is inner healing and deliverance. And, and he said, you know, it's kind of scary. And I said, it's scary because we want to remain hidden in our sinfulness. Just like Adam, when he found out he was naked, he wanted to hide. When we understand that we have things that are not great on the inside of us, we should run to God. We shouldn't hide. And we should run to one another. You know, it, it talks about in the New Testament that we're telling each other of these things that are going on in our life. It creates healing. Okay, I know some of you have maybe been hurt by gossip in the body, but I think that there have been enough instruction in this body to say, if you share something with me in confidence, 
it's going to stay in confidence. But healing takes place when we're willing to be vulnerable. We're willing to look at ourselves and say, I ain't so great, and I need help, and I need your help, and I need your help, and I need your help. Start small. Begin with small acts of sacrifice and gradually increase as you grow in the faith. And stay connected. Seek accountability and encouragement from fellow believers. Accountability is a big thing, people. You know, Mark Tubbs, who's going to be here in a couple weeks, is our apostolic overseer. Mark knows everything about us. Mark knows our bank accounts because we've been vulnerable to talk with him about that, our investments, our failures, our challenges, you know, because he's praying for us. He's, he's coaching us. He's mentoring us. He's, he's encouraging us to continue on. You know, we have developed a culture where we go, mm -mm, I'm not telling that person that. If you have a relationship of accountability, true accountability, that individual is going to pray for you. They are going to be in your corner. They're going to tell you stuff about yourself you may not want to hear. But you know what? If it's going to lead you to righteousness, then you need to hear it. I mean, I love that about my husband. You know, I've known him for 54 years. We've been married for 50. And as gentle and as healing as he is, if I'm off track, he will tell me, you know what? I think you need to think about what you're doing right now. I think you need to think about what you're saying right now. We need people like that in our lives. I don't need a yes person in my life. I need somebody who's going to promote me into righteousness and encourage me to walk before the Lord. Let's celebrate obedience. Let's recognize and celebrate the joy that comes from living a life of obedience. You know, we stepped into this ministry. It was obedience. And we left behind a very lucrative practice in order to do that. And we never looked back, and we never questioned why God would do that. And we've never had lack in our lives. When you function out of obedience and trust, you recognize that God truly is your resource. Amen? So let's conclude this today. The masterpiece of sacrifice. As we reflect on the stories of Abraham and David, let us remember that our lives are meant to be a masterpiece of sacrifice, painted with strokes of love, obedience, and surrender. May we, like Abraham, trust in God's provision, and like David, offer sacrifices that truly cost us something. In doing so, we honor Christ and fulfill our calling as living sacrifices, pleasing and acceptable to God. So what's your call of action this week? Embrace sacrifice. Take a step towards living a sacrificial life. Identify one area where you can offer more of yourself to God, whether it's through your time, your talents, your treasures. Make a conscious decision to embrace the cost of true sacrifice knowing that it will bring glory to God and it will deepen your relationship with him. Amen? All right. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for all that you are doing in our lives. We trust you, Lord. We recognize that this message may have been ouchy for some, but we also recognize that you are always looking to promote us in righteousness and holiness. So, God, I ask that we would be strong and courageous in this hour. 
that we would eradicate anything that would be between you and us, that we would trust you, that we would act out of obedience, that we would walk in faith. We recognize that you are doing a good work in your body. And so, Father, we just avail ourselves to all that you are doing in this hour. And we all say yes. We all say yes. We all say yes and amen. So be it, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.